Hello, and welcome to Pride in Progress, the conversation series over here at LGBTQ Victory Institute. My name is Jared Keith. I wear a few hats here at Victory Institute, but one of them, uh, and the one I'm coming to you today as, is uh, the editor of prideandprogress.org, which is our historical timeline. If you are interested in uh, important queer and trans moments in the political history, particularly in the United States, go to prideandprogress.org and um, we have a lot of resources there for you. And you can always leave us a note if you think that we should uh, add more information. Um, today, I'm really excited to welcome uh, Jean Brake from the Jose Saria Foundation, who um, is the founder of the Jose Saria Foundation and is really committed to getting the story of Jose and uh, his legacy out there um, to a new generation. And um, uh, as you may know, Jose uh, was the first known uh, out LGBTQ candidate for office in the United States. Um, he was uh, an out gay man and a drag performer um, who uh, like many uh, people in the gay community at the time, was under uh, intense uh, persecution from the police. And um, we'll get into all of that, uh, but that was definitely a big motivator in Jose running. Um, and so I uh, am delighted to bring Jean on. Hi, Jean, how are you? Hi, how are you, Jared? I'm doing great. It's a nice sunny day up here in DC. How is it over there in Spokane? Um, it's a beautiful sunny day here too. It, it's uh, beginning to warm up finally a little. Um, that's lovely. Uh, I know it can be uh, a challenge up there in the Pacific Northwest. <laughs> it can be. <laughs> <clears throat> um, so uh, I, you know, I, I, I mentioned a couple of uh, factoids about Jose, Jose Soria's life, but um, obviously it was a long and full and fabulous rich life. Um, you are joining us as the founder of the Jose Saria Foundation, and um, you knew Jose personally, and you are committed to preserving this legacy and furthering Absolutely. the legacy. Um, can you tell us a little bit about um, about Jose's early life? Let's let's just start chronologically. Um, sure. How did Jose grow up, and and how did he find himself in San Francisco? Well, he actually grew up in San Francisco, born and grew up in San Francisco. Um, he was uh, born um, out of wedlock to um, 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 Dolores Maldonado and um, his father, um, um, Jose Saria, um, senior, if you will, um, was um, not really a part of his life um, um, and didn't really support him. And so he grew up, you know, as this, you know, um, only child of Dolores, and um, she was a housekeeper, and so most of the time he actually spent time with his godparents growing up in, in the San Francisco in San Francisco. So he was in San Francisco. Yes. Um, I know that during the uh, the Second World War, he joined. He wound up joining uh, the military, the army. He right. Did. He did. Um. Um. How did that shape him? And then how did we get from this uh, military recruit to someone who uh, was at the sort of center of, of gay life in 1950s and 60s San Francisco? Well, I think we have to go back a little because Jose growing up um, was, uh, was allowed and freely dressed in women's clothing with his mother. They would go to dances and so forth um, and um, so he was not um, planning to be um, anyone leading the charge for anything politically, but he um, grew up in a very free environment um, of his mother's, you know, insistence that he be allowed to explore. And he did that in many ways in dressing in women's clothing um, and going to going to these um, dances and so forth, um, um, you know, in, in women's attire with his with his mother even. Um, and so when after Pearl Harbor, um, he felt it was important that he needed to do his duty um, as an American citizen to um, serve in the military. 
his, against his mother's wishes, of course, as every mother was in those days, um, against his mother's wishes. Um, but he, he was very short. So he was really too short to meet the requirements to join the military. And so he tried on numerous occasions and finally, um, after fibbing a bit about his height, um, was able to get into the army. Um, he served um, in the European theater. Um, um, as he describes it, they were part of the lower flank of the Battle of the Bulge and marched into Berlin at the very end. So um, he was in the heart of the fight um, against fascism in those days. And so he comes home to San Francisco. Yes. He's, he he's already to has him. some history with, with cross-dressing or, or sure. dressing in women's clothing, clothing and, and female impersonation. Right. Um, what was life like kind of backing up for for people who were gay or who were drag queens in, in um, the very well, early 1960s? You know, and you think of San Francisco as being a very freewheeling place, but it, it 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 really wasn't in those days, just as in any communities in the late 40s. So he came back from World War II in 1947 to San Francisco. And although there were lots of bars and lots of men now in San Francisco as a result of the war effort, um, they were still off limits bars um, to military personnel. Um, and that... And it really grew out of um, the executive orders of President Truman um, to um, clamp um, communism, um, which sort of grew into the McCarthy era. And so they um, were clamping down on all sorts of bars that had um, potential homosexuals in them. Um, and so he was certainly swept up in all of that. Um, working in a bar called the Black Cat, beginning, um, it's a, it's assumed it's the, around 1950. We're not exactly certain when he started working at the Black Cat, but he was working there as a waiter. He met the first love of his life there, um, which was his ultimate love of his life. Um, and um, the bar was one of those that was swept up in um, vice officers coming in, arresting patrons, arresting bar owners. Um, um, because they were catering to homosexuals. Um, and so that sort of thing continued in, in, well, that sort of thing continued into the 90s, into the South and in, in Texas, but it was very prevalent in those days. Um, an example was if you dressed in women's clothing, you could be arrested because you were trying to deceive someone. So Jose came up with the idea, no, well, let's put a little, wear a little badge that is a black, it's a black cat with the statement that says, I'm a boy on it. So when a police officer tried to arrest you for wearing women's clothing, you go, no, no, I've got a badge right here that says I'm a boy. I'm not trying to deceive anyone. So he often used the term, you know, you need to be a thinking queen. And he said, you need to think about what you can do and how you can circumvent some of those hazards in those days to our community. It's the um, 60th anniversary, right? Yeah. Of, of Jose uh, running for office. Um, I'm not exactly sure how um, the primaries and everything worked back in California then. So I'm, I'm guessing we're saying November is the, is the 60th anniversary of him being on, on the ballot. But um but his activism didn't start, you know, with with a run for office or, or some sort of political ambition. It started yeah. with this sort of community response to um, persecution. Correct. Correct. Um, so, uh, what were some of the um, some of the sort of police tactics and, and legalized state state sanctioned persecution um, that Jose and and uh, his community were fighting against. Well, in the in that era, in the late '40s, early '50s, um, there was a great deal of police involvement in um, trying to shut down uh, any bar that would have um, gay men in it. And of course, there were no apps in those days to meet men. So the way you met men, you would either go to a bar or, you know, um, and that sort of thing like that. So so here they were going to a bar. And so it was against the law for two men to dance, to even touch each other, 
um, to, and so they would um, come into the black cat and they would come in, it was funny, dressed as what they thought a homosexual would dress like and try to entrap men and say, okay, hey, let's go, let's go out, let's go to my place or let's go for a walk. So as they would leave the bar, they would be arrested. Um, simply for no other reason but the fact that they had agreed to go with this policeman somewhere. And they didn't know he was a policeman, of course. So um, vice officers. And so this was Jose's first um, fight back was, how are we going to fight this? And, and the way that it was often dealt with is these men would plead guilty to make the case go away. Um, um, they, they, they just would plead guilty, you know, they were embarrassed, they were horrified, and so they would plead guilty. And so one of Jose's things was, no, no, you force this, you make them go to trial with this, don't just plead guilty. Um, and finally, that's exactly how they stopped it was all of these people would force these things to go to trial where the judges would just throw the cases out. And so they finally, um, just through the sheer numbers of clogging up the court system in those days, is how they fought back. And Jose was instrumental in that. Um, um, in the bar, um, he himself um, and became entrapped in a situation, um, went into, um, um, was at the St. Francis Bar, um, the hotel, um, and was arrested. Um, and it was someone he knew. And he said, well, this person knew me, but they needed to make an example of someone. And he was a very visible person they could make an example of. And so he, at the time, was in college, and he was trying to, he wanted to be a school teacher. And he knew with this on his record now that he could not be a school teacher. It would not, it wouldn't work. And so he vowed then, he said, well, if you, if you won't let me do this, if you've destroyed my life, I'm going to be the most notorious drag queen. And as he put it, he says, I'm going to be, I'm going to make you pay to come see me um, as this deviant, which is what you were labeled as in those days. So that was where he said, nope, we're going to force you force our issues, and we're going to force um, people to reckon with us as equals. Um, he didn't consider himself less than. He didn't consider himself a second-class citizen. Matter of fact, he would repeatedly say that. Um, and so he was going to uh, um, do all these things to, to, to make it um, where people weren't afraid. One of the things he used to do is whenever he would be on stage performing at the Black Cat, which really kind of grew out of him just being a waiter and one day the piano player was playing a, a song that he knew. And so he started singing along and that grew into him doing parodies of torch songs and then parodies of full operas. But when he would see someone that he knew was a vice officer would come in, he would call them out. Um, and so to prevent them from harassing their patrons, he would actually call them out from stage. Hey, you're a police officer, aren't you? Um, and so they, in those days had to, yes, I am a police officer. Okay. Everyone pay attention. He's a police officer. So um, he did those sorts of things to uh, fight from the stage, which made him a big target to the police um, because he was calling them out. So so what um, what motivated him? What was the sort of tipping point where he said, all right, I'm going to I'm going to run for office. I'm going to run for uh, San Francisco uh, supervisor. Well, you know, I don't know that there was one particular tipping point that did it other than his arrest um, that sort of built from there um, to the point where he said, this is, you know, people wouldn't, you know, today, you know, in the gay community, we're very out about who we are and, and, and who, who we are as people. But in those days, they weren't. And so he said, well, you know, one way that I can prove to you that we are just as equal as everyone else is that I'm going to run for political office. And he said, um, it, every one of us can run for office. And people said, oh, no, you can't run. You're gay. No, we all can. This is how we prove that we're equal. And so that's what he did. He ran for office. In those days, you had to get um, um, 25 people, I believe it was, a certain number of people to sign this document that said, okay, yes, we support his candidacy. And so um, the day before the filing period was over, um, there are five positions available in the city supervisor, which was um, an at-large, not by districts then, um, and there were only five candidates, one of them being Jose. And the local um, Democratic Party at the time said, oh, well, we can't let 
a drag queen be city supervisor, we've got to get more people to run. So by the next day, a total of 34 candidates were declared um, because of them encouraging it. So he didn't win, but wow. 6,000 votes, which proved for the first time that an out gay person could get votes and that there was absolutely a gay voting block in San Francisco. What was his campaign like? Um, that's a that's a wild story about getting on the ballot, but um, not not very surprising, I, I guess. <laughs> right. But in terms of, um, I've seen a couple of photos, you know, a couple of announcements and newspaper clips. But um, you know, what what was the actual? Um, was he doing events? Did he have a staff? Did he have um, outreach? What was going on? Well, his campaign headquarters that he referred to really was the Black Cat, and it was his, his base of support was all based in the Black Cat there on Montgomery Street in San Francisco. And so he um, had to borrow a suit, he said. He didn't have a suit at the time. So he had to borrow a suit to have photographs taken. But his campaign was equality under the law, and his goal was to uh, equality under the law. And that was his campaign based purely on that. And it was, you know, that he wanted to push that issue and um, almost was successful and actually was quite successful in, in his not winning. What, what came out of that uh, once, you know, November rolled around and, and the results came in? Um, this is the first time this had happened, not just in San Francisco, but anywhere. Um, right. What, well, you what, would say, he said, you know, although he was very disappointed not winning, um, and he was initially quite disappointed, but everyone ever actually think the community around him said, no, you proved to us it was important that you did this. And though you didn't win, um, we know that we, you made a huge showing. I mean, no one would have thought that he would have done as well as he did. But in his loss, I think that it encouraged other people to fight back even harder because it was a it was a near it was close he, he was just a couple thousand votes out of um winning a place on the city supervisor and so he um in his loss um inspired people to fight even harder just like he had it's the 60th anniversary um yeah. of of this event as you're looking back um the, at, at this particular piece of, of Jose's legacy, um, what are you hoping um, people will take away from from sort of the the attention that we're putting on this this year? Well, to 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 just if nothing else, that you know, even though you're just one person, you can make a difference. Um, you don't need to be a huge mob of people to do something you need to make up your mind and you need to stand up and speak out for yourself. And as a result, you speak out for others. And that was, Jose was in many ways a reluctant activist. He was standing up for himself. And when he saw injustice, he said, encourage people to speak out against injustice. And sometimes those reluctant activists are the ones who end up making the biggest difference. But it starts with each one of us making a commitment to stand up and say, no, we're not going to accept that. Tell us about um, Jose's later years and later legacy. What what should folks uh, uh, know um, about Jose? Well, so his his in those days he was mostly known as you know the singer the the Nightingale of Montgomery Street um, at the Black Cat Cafe, and the Black Cat Cafe um, was involved in a very a very influential lawsuit that really happened in 1951. Um, and it was um, the California Supreme Court case, Stuman versus Riley, that for the first time, proved that, that actually said that gay and lesbians could congregate. Before that, it was illegal for them to even be in a bar together. But it, it said, no, they have a right to congregate and gather as anyone else does. So we have to think about um, pride itself grew out of this little bar um, in, in, in North, you know, in on Montgomery Street that fought um, and, and won this case. Now they did end up losing, losing their liquor license. In 1963, they lost their liquor license just before Halloween. 
and then ultimately closed in February of 1964. Um, but that, so here, here, Jose is depressed, he's sad, and a friend of his, Pierre Parker, comes to him and says, okay, we're, we're going to, we're, we're going to, I've got this little opportunity. He would ran restaurants in World's Fairs. And so he and Jose ran restaurants in um, the World's Fair in New York, in Montreal, San Antonio, Spokane, and Knoxville. So from 1964 through 1982, Jose was very involved um, in the, the restaurant business, um, running a little French restaurant called Pierre Interlude um, in these World's Fairs, which took him all over the country um, and through Can in Canada. Um, and um, got to spread his mission, if you will, to these different communities. Um, in 1965, he was named um, Queen of the Beau Arts Ball, um, which was a tavern guild function in San Francisco. Um, and he said, no, no, I I've always been a queen. I'm going to declare myself Empress. And so, um, which began what is the, well, one of the largest um, gay and lesbian organizations in, in the world, which is the International Imperial Court System. Um, and so he proclaimed himself Empress. Um, drawing on um, a Civil War era eccentric fellow called Emperor Norton in San Francisco, drew on that, and uh, thus began his quest to expand this. And so it was one of the earliest organizations that, that raised funds in the battle against AIDS. Um, they fought the Briggs Initiative in California. Um, it was the, he was the nucleus of a great, powerful community of people raising funds, fighting injustice. And so um, we owe a lot to Jose. Many people don't realize it. I think Jose absolutely proves that uh, high camp can be political. Oh, it can. Um, he just lived such a fabulous life on his own terms. And, and he did. And, you know, and, take, and sadly, you know, he, he experienced a great deal of heartache and, and as well as anyone would. Um, but because he devoted so much of his life um, to the international court system and through the political intervention, you know, he ultimately had to move out of San Francisco when he could no longer afford to live there. And so I think his is a story that is replicated over and over again. Um, you know, our seniors in our community are getting priced out of where they live and unfortunately don't have a big financial nest egg like, you know, those in the corporate world. So. Um, which was how he ended up first moving to Palm Springs um, and then moved, he moved for a time with Pierre in Arizona and then ultimately moved to Albuquerque, New Mexico, which is where he passed when he was 90. Um, if folks want to learn more uh, about Jose and his legacy, uh, where do they go? Well, there's, so there's lots of places to go. He, he, one of the greatest places, of course, while well, we are happy to assist in facilita facilitating that through the Jose Saria Foundation at josesaria.org, but one of the best places and where many of Jose's uh, personal possessions and, and historic documents were donated were to the uh, GLBT archives in San Francisco. I think it's GLB, I won't, I won't speak to their website, but anyway, GLBT archives in San Francisco. Another place that uh, many of his items, some of his items were donated was to the um, museum, um, the Oakland Museum of California. Um, those are two places that many of his items and his historic documents went to. And uh, certainly both of those are great resources to find uh, more out, more about Jose. Um, there's also two great films out um, that speak to his legacy. Um, one um, was called 50 Years of Fabulous um, that really spoke to the 50th anniversary of the Imperial Court in San Francisco. And then a great film that is going to, um, that's out, out now, and it will be part of the Frameline Film Festival, um, which is called Nellie Queen, um, The Life and Times of Jose Saria, which really delves deep all about his past, his military history, the learnings from that time in the military that pushed him to be a leader in our community later. Um, and so it's a great film um, that really touches a great deal on many facets of his life. And that's um, um, a great film that's available now. That's going to be in Frameline Film Festival, I think, the end of this month, May, um, 
June the 25th, I believe. But anyway, it's available, and that's a great place to learn more about his life. Well, Gene, thank you so much for those resources and for for uh, all of this great information about Jose. Um, uh, we are so appreciative of the work that you're doing. Um, here at Victory Institute, we're the only organization that uh, devotes itself to training um, and supporting LGBTQ people who are seeking office, um, elected or appointed around the world. And so um, Jose is someone we uh, are continually inspired by because we're still, um, for better or worse, facing a lot of the same, <laughs> the exact same issues. It seems um, to come in cycles over the, you know, over our history. And he, he certainly, I, I certainly personally draw a great deal of inspiration from Jose, and I know many of us do. And I thank thank the Victory Institute for all you're doing to try to shine the light on our history and to make sure that people remember. Jose for his many contributions. Of course, of course. Uh, well, thank you again so much, Gene. Um, I'll let you get back to your day, but thank you for this lovely conversation. It was great to visit with you too, Jared. <laughs>